Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Baldridge Foundation's Institute for Performance Excellence webinar, Consumerism, the Pay Provider Fault Line. Before we get started today, I want to take a moment and recognize all of our great sponsors and a special thanks to the members of the Mac Baldridge Society who serve as the trustees of the Foundation's Institute for Performance Excellence. Here is today's agenda. Our facilitator today is Dr. Roger Spulman, Senior Advisor, Strategy, Leadership, and Innovation, and the co-host of the Baldridge Foundation Leader Dialogue Program. Dennis Butts, Guidehouse Partner and Health Strategy Innovation Leader. Chuck Peck, co-host of the Baldridge Foundation Leader Dialogue Program. Darren Vasillo, co-founder and chief medical officer about healthcare. And Ben Sawyer, industry expert from about healthcare. I'll be your moderator later today during the question and answer period. And now we're going to get started and I'll turn it over to Roger. Great, thank you, Al. And once again, thank you to the Baldridge Foundation for sponsoring these webinars. And I wanna thank all of you who have taken time this afternoon to join us. We are grateful that uh, we know there are lots of competing things that you could be doing. Uh, and we're glad that you've decided to join us. This wouldn't be as helpful or useful without you. And we really expect you to weigh in with some questions and some comments. And we'd be delighted to hear those questions. And uh, we want your opinions. We want to make sure that we're doing what's really helpful to you. And, and I have no doubt about that. Today's discussion about uh, this intersection between payers and providers, and we've even coined a new word, which we're going to our, our new word has been coined. We didn't do it, but we're going to ask uh, about that very soon. And and Chuck, Dr. Peck, my colleague, I'm going to ask you to to uh, introduce our guest, Dennis, uh, because you were colleagues. But while you do that, I just want to, again, um, talk about what we're going to be sharing today. And that's uh, so much has been happening in this area. Uh, many of you are healthcare leaders. You have your heads down looking at the crisis in front of you, wondering how are we going to manage from day to day. As I talk to my colleagues, many of you are listening or they, they share the same types of roles as you do. And man, I've heard so much from those in administration about um, you know, we just can't get enough staff. We've we've got staffing crisis, staffing issues. Um, I hear about the fact that we don't have enough volume. Our volume is gone. It hasn't come back to the level that we were accustomed to. So now our challenge is we're getting our cost, trying to get our costs down to where the volume is. Uh, I've heard some of you talk about we don't have time to innovate when let's let's get into that a little bit later we don't have time not to innovate in my opinion and and i think that is shared by my panelists my friends on the panel but um lots of things going on and we hope that at the end of today's webinar you will have some sense of what's next what can i do next what can i do right now to help maybe break this cycle of of um you know, crisis and how do I lead out of this crisis? So with that in mind, Chuck, would you mind introducing Dennis to our guests today on the webinar? Absolutely. Thanks, Roger. Uh, so for those of you who have uh, regularly been attending our podcast that we do twice a month, uh, some of you uh, are familiar with Dennis Butts. Dennis uh, was, a, was a colleague of mine. I've known Dennis for many years. Uh, Dennis is probably one of the leading experts in the uh, payer provider partnership area, in addition to being a partner at Guidehouse and the leader of the innovation and strategy practice. Uh, one of the reasons I think we have such a large live audience today is that Dennis was kind enough to do a podcast with us uh, to talk to begin the discussion about the pay provider uh, about uh, four to five weeks ago. And it was really uh, just a terrific uh, hour uh, that we had with Dennis. And I think he was able to compress a lot of what people were, were wondering about and questioning about whether they should even look at becoming a payer, so to speak, in addition to being a provider of care, what some of the successful organizations are in the country that have done that. And, and Dennis has helped many of those. So he has on the ground experience doing that. Uh, and because that podcast was was so uh, widely attended and we got so many comments on it, 
we decided to ask Dennis back and he was kind enough to agree to do this hour long webinar today. So I'm really, really excited to welcome back an old friend and a, a really smart guy, uh, particularly in the strategy and innovation space. So thanks again, Dennis, for being here today. Uh, thanks, Chuck. Uh, more, more than happy to be here. And you're you're putting the pressure on me to make sure that we have a good session today. So I'll, I'll take you up on it. Okay. <laughs> I don't think there's any question. It's going to be a great session, Dennis. And, and, you know, those of you who do listen to the podcast know that Chuck and I share this responsibility. And, you know, we kind of alternate uh, the hosting duties. And so it's fun for me to listen to the podcast that I don't participate in. And Dennis, I loved your interview. It was fantastic. And it was 30 minutes as usual, you know, as often happens, 30 minutes was way too short to really mine your depth of experience and your insights into this topic. So we're just delighted that you've agreed to come back and share this hour with us and respond to questions from our audience. So Dennis, again, not to heap more pressure on you, but uh, you're the expert here. We all have opinions, but you've kind of lived this. And so let me start out and ask the question. Maybe it's the obvious question, or you know, maybe somebody sneaked into this webinar who hasn't been reading you know, the periodicals of the profession, and they see this word pay viter. You know, could you begin, Dennis, by explaining what that is and then and, and take as much time as you like to go through uh, these fascinating slides? But what's a pay viter? Yeah, I, I, I think that in the simplest form, uh, the pay viter model is a contractual relationship between a, a payer um, and a provider um, that comes with more stickiness than what we've seen historically, where uh, there's been kind of wins and, and winners and losers in typical payer and provider relationships. I, I think that payers are recognizing more and more that providers are, are needed to deliver on what they're looking for for their business models. And due to the challenges uh, Roger, that you just went through on the provider side, providers are having to get more access to the premium dollar in order to have a revenue model that works, especially as um, the government book of business continues to increase, which means that uh, payment rates are are challenging for health systems as the government book is a lot less reimbursed than the commercial book. Um, but we also know that um, every health system does not have the the war chest, if you will, to start their own health plan. I mean, so is there a model in between where we can create uh, uh, more meaningful relationships that are a win-win between payers and providers? And so they can come in many different shapes and forms and sizes. It could be uh, a direct employment relationships, as you're seeing many of the national players like Optum, who will probably be the largest employer of physicians in the near future. Um, those type of arrangements, it could be a joint venture between a payer and a provider around a specific uh, health uh, health plan product. It could be long-term risk contracts and where a provider is taking on more risk in exchange for more premium. And so when you hear the word pay provider, it's not just one, uh, one, one uh, form of a contract. It may look uh, different in different parts of the market. And I think what's best for uh, both payers and providers to find out what is the model that works best for you uh, in your market for your strategic objectives. And that's a lot of the work that I do to help payers and providers figure out exactly what that is. That's great. That's great. And, and um, boy, I've got a lot more questions about that in terms of what is possible and is it too late to start? And, and, and I know you have a lot of great opinions about that. Before we get into that, Dennis, and thank you for that uh, great introduction. I want to go back. If we go back to the the consumerism slide and and talk a little bit about what consumers are prioritizing these days. And and Ben, I know that you have uh, great insights into this too, just from your professional role and and what you're doing with about healthcare, but also you uh, you read voraciously in the field. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about consumerism uh, and get us going in that. Yeah, I'd be happy to yeah. do that. And I, I do apologize to the audience that for some reason, my camera is not working today on Zoom. That may be good, actually. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, thank you. Thank you for that. No. Just... <laughs> but anyway, um, the context of what Dennis is talking about as it relates to consumerism is really important. I think all of us uh, would agree that um, the pandemic has really accelerated consumerism in, in the market. And what consumers are really prioritizing, which is resulting in payers and providers wanting to curate the consumer experience, which is part of where the payvider initiative has, has commenced, is consumers are wanting to take proactive control of their health, 
and they're really reconsidering their health and wellness needs post pandemic. They really want convenience, accessibility and quality, and they do a lot of searching for providers just like they do every other product. And so they're looking for four or five star providers. In fact, the difficulty in contacting the office uh, based on research is the number one roadblock to acquisition. This is from Prescani's uh, research and 84% of patients would change their mind about seeing a provider rated less than four stars, which is kind of, you know, that's been evolving, but definitely exploded after the pandemic. The holistic wellness and mental health uh, needs are rising in importance, particularly because of the negative impact from COVID on mental health. And people just want to improve their overall well-being and coping skills. Uh, digital access and technology become essential differentiators. So digital front door capabilities, telemedicine. We'll learn later that telemedicine has exploded by about 338% since the advent of the pandemic, other, other specialized services, wearables, et cetera. And then they just want expanded choices and service options. That That's not nice to have. That's expected now by the consumers. Hey, Ben, be, yeah. before we leave this, you know, it just occurred to me that we also, we healthcare systems um, amazingly ramped up so quickly in a sort of a low tech personal area you know, it's kind of low tech, the drive through model, yeah. you know, I mean, how quickly did every healthcare system say, we don't want them in our building, but they can be in our parking lot and they can come through and get a COVID test. And, and then it wasn't just healthcare providers. It was every Rite Aid, Walgreens, CVS, you know, again, kind of low tech. It's still, you know, in person, but I don't have to get out of my car. I did this several times because, you know, we needed to go to Mexico and it didn't need it to get to Mexico. We wanted to come home. We needed it to get out of Mexico and back into the United States. But, you know, that, you know, it just shows the resilience of healthcare systems and their ability to adjust. And they ramped this one up very quickly, didn't they? Yeah. And speaking of things getting ramped up quickly, uh, this slide sort of represents that there has been a explosion of consumer-based technology. So if you look at the image on the right-hand side of the screen over here, you can see the user is at the center of a myriad of consumer user demand needs and kind of where the technology comes in, whether it's med tech or patient portals or wearables, et cetera. And this is just, this picture is just a 31 or so, what they refer to as healthcare unicorns, which are startups that are now valued greater than, valued greater than a billion. There are thousands of them. And what it's doing is it's, it is uh, driving this change that, that Dennis started to talk about, which essentially is a whole rapid expansion of disruptive non-traditional players. You mentioned some of them, Roger, uh, Walgreens, CVS, uh, Walmart, which is a really interesting uh, version of that. And I'll, I'll just go into that one really briefly to, to explain why that's so interesting. So as probably everybody knows, Walmart touches about one of every eight Americans. Uh, and that population tends to be a certain socioeconomic class. And they have certain incidences of, of uh, diseases and illnesses higher than other percents of the population, like, for example, type 2 diabetes. So they, Walmart has two intents for getting into healthcare. One, they want healthy consumers because healthy consumers buy more. And, and they altruistically want to have make sure that their consumer base is healthy. The other is that as they have these ad, increasingly advanced healthcare resources at their super centers, people are stopping by the store on the way out. So they get an increase in commercial transactions. So the, po the point of that that's in, important for this audience is Walmart can invest in healthcare as a loss leader. They make money when they bring their, their patients, their clients to their um, clinics, whereas healthcare providers, typically health systems, don't have that privilege because they're not doing retail sales, right? And, and therefore, they can't pick up the revenue by, by cost discounting uh, the care. So those are, those are indications of non-traditional providers. Payers getting into the space as a pay provider is also kind of a non-traditional version, although it's been, as Dennis alluded to, it's been in play for quite a while. So that context of consumerism 
which is, which is exploding right now is an important context for health system leaders to understand because there's a huge technical push behind it. And there is a growing non-traditional, but huge company push like Amazon, Walmart, United Health Group, no joke. These are huge systems. And Ben, this is Ben and Roger. This is Chuck. One other interesting part about Walmart, I think. And um, I, about a week and a half ago, I had the opportunity to speak to a colleague of mine, Dr. Cheryl Pegas, who I've known for many years. She's the chief medical officer at Walmart, and they are absolutely committed to uh, rural health and and health in healthcare in in rural America. And they've started uh, selling their own insulin. They, they recognized how impossible it was for their particular clientele um, who have a high incidence of diabetes, heart failure, uh, obesity, et cetera. So they're doing something very similar to what Mark Cuban is doing when, in his new pharmaceutical company. But they're specifically targeting drugs that impact specifically their consumers. And I think it has a lot to do with what you said, which is, you know, if people are at home not feeling well, their sugar's up, they ha they're, they're feeling sick, they're not coming in to buy things. And so I, I think that, you know, there's certainly that, that revenue um, associated reason, but I, I really get the sense from Cheryl that they are very, very committed to rural health care. And, and she's also, she also said something very interesting, and that is that we all assume that the big problem in rural America is access. And uh, they've just done a, a huge study where they've interviewed uh, thousands and thousands of providers in rural America. And what they found was that access isn't the issue, resources is the issue. Yeah. P having people in the provider's office to help patients, to counsel patients, to talk to patients um, as a pharmacist one-to-one, -to, -one, to help with compliance, uh, to look at social needs, to look at transportation. It's really the resource issue and not the access issue, which I found interesting because everybody's always talking about access in rural America and not having enough providers. That apparently isn't really the biggest issue. The biggest issue is, is resource constraints. Yeah, that's great, great, great idea or great uh, concept there or information, Chuck. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, yeah, ben, and Chuck, I was just going to say that ties into this whole notion of when you're curating a consumer experience, you have to understand what is actually driving their ability to create, to, to gain access and to get the kind of care they need. That's that's what the the winners will do is, the, is they understand from a curation standpoint, what the consumers really need and what they're looking for. And and Ben, you and I talked about this on another conversation yesterday. We talked about, um, you know, rural America and, and solving issues. And, uh, and I think you're absolutely right, Chuck. It's access is one thing, but really it's the relationship and who's going to pay for this and, and all that. Ben, we were talking about Dollar General. You know, mm -hmm. so even Walmart, as pervasive as they are, who's going to try and compete with Walmart? Well, I think there are more Dollar General stores than there are Walmarts, and their their market is even further down the chain in terms of in rural America, and and they find these even smaller markets, and they are well. Go ahead and talk about that, Ben. You know quite a bit about that, and then this. Uh, Network. Well, I actually, I want to get it back over to Dennis, but you're right. I mean, yeah. essentially what happens is these companies that have traditionally just been consumer-based transactional goods and, you know, goods type of companies are getting into the healthcare services space for all the reasons you just described, Roger. Um, so, but back to, back to Dennis, the reason I, the, the reason yeah. I wanted to bring that up is because in the past, Dennis, we're just so interested in your opinion on this. In the past, now this none of this is new. Ten years ago, we were talking to to Walgreens and CVS, and and Walmart has been talking about this when they started doing uh, low cost drugs, low cost, no cost drugs. You know, just a filling fee for prescriptions and and that sort of thing. No, it's not new. But what happened is a pandemic, you know, that changed right. everything. It really, it made it relevant. It made it really necessary to talk about this. And, and Dennis, as I recall our, you know, in health systems, when we thought about a partnership with 
some of these non-traditional providers, what we supplied the, the, um, the equation, what we brought to the table to a Walgreens network or CVS was the providers. And now that's not something that health systems are able to do. They don't have the capacity to do it. So let's talk about provider, the, uh, the payers. The payers are the ones, Optum and, and others. We started talking about that. So really the, the table stakes have changed dramatically. I, I love this slide. Why don't you talk about Medicare Advantage? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's interesting. Um, uh, I, I believe the number is still true that every, every day 10,000 Americans become Medicare eligible. Um, it, it's probably even a, a, a greater number now as we continue to look at the increase in the senior population. And it, it's interesting. I, I, I think that narrow networks didn't work before in a commercial space or an employer space. I, I think in healthcare, yes, we want more for, affordable care. Yes, we want higher quality but we still want choice um, and narrow networks. So we're limiting that choice. And I think that that's one of the things that curb the proliferation of narrow networks in this country. Um, but as we look at Medicare Advantage, uh, the majority of seniors continue to choose Medicare Advantage over traditional fee for service Medicare. And so I think that there's an alignment in this trend where consumers, you know, we just talked about consumers choice, et cetera, are opting for Medicare Advantage versus some of the limitations for fee for service medicine. We, we have health systems who are challenged financially as they're looking to uh, provide care for seniors and for payers. The, the Medicare Advantage line of business is their most profitable business line, around $200 per member per month. So with this rapidly growing population, huge profit center for payers, financial challenges for providers, it's creating this nexus of everyone has an interest in providing the right amount of care for this patient population. Um, I, I, I believe that uh, just even last year, Medicare Advantage still grew by 9%. Uh, we're expecting that uh, more than half of the population of Medicare uh, to be opt into uh, uh, Medicare Advantage over the next 10 years. And so uh, this is a movement that's not going to stop. Um, and it's something that we're going to pay attention to. I mean, it's interesting with, uh, uh, again, not looking at narrow networks and taking things away. Many of the health plans are offering zero premiums. Yeah. Um, they're offering additional supplemental benefits around dental, hearing, vision. So there are a, a lot of pluses that come with Medicare Advantage. And unlike narrow networks, health plans and providers who are really winning are taking the excess premium and actually building better access, building be better technology tools, making it easier to see your physician. Let's do real care coordination. And the results prove it. Um, when you look at uh, Medicare Advantage plans that are out there, patients are satisfied. 99% um, say that they uh, love their plan versus only 85% in fee-for-service medicine. As we look at hospitalizations, 23% fewer, 33% fewer ED, 41% fewer inpatient stays. So when we have a better care coordination model with the right resources, is leading to better care, but also a better patient experience with a financial model if done the right way, where payers and providers can all win. And so it's interesting seeing a phenomenon of what's happening in the Medicare Advantage space. So Dennis, uh, this is this is Chuck. So let me let me put it in a little bit of a different way, and, and see whether you agree it or not. So um, th the only time in in recent history that I'm aware of where there was a significant reduction in in overall healthcare cost was back in the mid '90s during the, the you know the heyday of um, you know HMOs, HMOs. etc. And I think what you just said, and please, please correct me if, if this is incorrect, and I'm speaking now as a health system or as a health system provider. If I can provide high quality care at a reasonable cost and the revenue associated with Medicare Advantage in those patients, and if I'm able to do it in that particular population, which would hopefully then spill over to my other populations, commercial, fee-for-service, et cetera, the revenue associated with that Medicare Advantage patient is actually a very good thing for me if I can do those other things that I mentioned. Yeah, if, if you can do those other things and if you can create uh, beneficial uh, relationships with health plans. I, I was uh, interacting with a client yesterday and because of the de denials that are there in the Medicare Advantage space, uh, they're contracting for around 100% of Medicare, but their actual payments are 93 to 
So it's not only providing the right care, but also nurturing and, and maximizing your health plan relationships. And I think most health systems maybe don't know how to uh, a best leverage or, or best bring to the table the essentiality of their network to make sure that you have the right terms and conditions that help you out, not just in your rate, but also in the process, the denials and your actual payments. But if you do all those things, I completely agree, Chuck, that yes, this can be a win for providers for sure. Dennis, um, you know, in the old days, I think people generally would choose their health system first. They had a strong um, affinity with their health system and a trust level there. And then they would choose their, uh, try anyway, to choose their health plan based on their participation or their ability to participate with their health provider. How do you see that changing right now? Um, so what are they choosing first? I think a lot are, are choosing their primary care physician. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think that that's why you see so much disruption with, um, you know, the Oak Streets of the world, Village MDs, you know, et, et cetera, um, uh, health plans buying primary care because as seniors uh, transition from uh, uh, commercial to uh, Medicare, uh, who's been my primary care physician over the past 15 years? Who's cared for me and in my family? And as I choose my network, uh, the payer is almost in the background. Um, I want to choose who I can make sure I, I continue to see my, my primary care physician of choice and I have the ability to uh, go to the providers that I would like. Uh, and, and so uh, providers can, can really leverage uh, that in the conversation with the payers. If you have a robust primary care base, uh, you're in a position to win. Uh, those who do not have a strong primary care base or based on what I think has been mentioned, as we look at quality scores and patient satisfaction, um, they, they aren't seen to be as high performing in those areas. Uh, those are the organizations who are going to be disadvantaged in the future. So, Dennis, is that why there's still a, a, some significant swaths of the country where you, you hardly see Medicare Advantage still today? Yeah, it, yeah I think so. Um, uh, some parts of the country are, are rapidly growing. Um, some um, aren't growing as much. There, there's a big conversion factor um, when your primary care physician says, hey, there's something different that you might want to consider um, as you begin to look at Medicare and here's why Medicare Advantage might be best for you. And oh, yes, by the way, I'll still be able to see you provide all these extra benefits. Um, and so a lot of that conversion is not happening just at uh, your local grocery store as people are trying to figure out, you know, what plan do I sign up on or sign up with? But a lot of those conversations are happening at the primary care level to make that smooth transition. We won't get into the implications of if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. Um, you know, today, but, but that was a lesson, wasn't it? It was a, that was, that kind of pinpointed what people really were looking for. Well, we've got a slide up here from McKinsey in terms of, you know, some suggestions about how to, should we prioritize innovation or not? And as we said earlier, that a number of people have, a number of systems have, um, abandoned, uh, innovation because they were in a crisis. We had a podcast uh, that just recorded yesterday talking with uh, the CEO of About Healthcare. And we talked about what is it like to try and operate in a crisis? Your senses are dulled to other things. And innovation may be one of those things because I don't have time to innovate because I just can't staff my beds. I just can't get enough providers. You know, so so now we have some suggestions from McKinsey. I, I don't know who wants to. Well, talk yeah. So about this maybe right. I can jump in on this one because yeah. what's interesting about this one is that McKinsey was looking historically at the financial crisis in two thousand eight, and what they were trying to do is assess what is the result of organizations that went ahead and really innovated versus those that that didn't, and you can see the gap. So the light blue line is those that innovated through the crisis and the dark blue line was the rest of the S&P 500. And on the right side is a graph of executives that were basically saying, look, we don't necessarily feel confident to do all these things, but we're going to do them anyway. Right. Um, so, and, and it, it shows the highest point. There is a 30% gap between those organizations that, uh, innovated in spite of discomfort, I think is maybe the way to, to depict it, versus their peers in the S, you know, S&P 500. And the assumption is if, if that was true during that level of crisis, 
may it also be true in this level of crisis as we're coming out of the pandemic. Yeah, and, and Ben, you know, just from personal experience, having been in the, uh, and, and Dennis knows this as well, having, have, having worked with me in several of these, you know, I can't think of a single client, turnaround client, and I did a lot of turnarounds um, during my years as a consultant. I can't think of a single turnaround client that was able to grow without innovating. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, the go-to strategy still is let's cut our expenses to meet our declining volume. At what time do you stop that free fall and put the brakes on and say, wait a second, we might be missing something here. And uh, thank goodness there are people who like yourselves who have given some really solid advice about how to do that. And again, this, we have to be careful. This isn't about shame or blame, you know, and, and, uh, right being critical of health systems who are focusing on reducing their costs, probably work that should have been done. All of us know this, having worked in this field, you know, we should have been more attentive to this perhaps years ago. It's when you're, when you're making a comfortable three to 5% margin, there's not a lot of pressure to do that. But then when, when these uh, headwinds, which kind of are this next slide, talk about labor inflation, supply inflation, and, and, and our revenue is down because our investments aren't returning what we counted on them doing. Then we need to say, what isn't working? You know, what isn't working about this? Or when is uh, enough, when are enough cuts enough? And, and how much is enough? Let's try and beef up the revenue. So let's talk about that. What are some, some opportunities to create additional demand? Yeah, and, and from the work that our good friends, uh, the Healthcare Advisory Board out of D.C. Um, Health or, Management sorry, Academy, sorry. sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the Healthcare Management Academy, yeah. HMA, have done. Uh, it shows exactly what the answer to that question. In other words, everyone is focusing on a consumer strategy. I mean, they're, they're trying to figure that out. The challenge is there's just a disproportionate amount of financial priorities that are trying to stabilize the workforce and also recognizing that you have to have some changes in your IT solutions infrastructure and other things. Um, and so you're, you're kind of in a catch up situation, right? You have, you have limited uh, resources as was demonstrated in this last slide, right? You have declining margins and then, and rising costs and, and reduced revenue because your volumes aren't coming back and your investments aren't uh, pan panning out like you had hoped. And so here you are having to be able to figure out, um, you know, how to, how to move forward. And so this, this just kind of tip of the iceberg uh, research from the Health Management Academy in Kauffman Hall uh, demonstrates that challenge that healthcare leaders are facing right now. Yeah. You know, I, I think... I just want to remind our uh, folks, our our uh, guests, that this would be a really good time if you haven't already submitted a question. We're going to try and take the last ten or fifteen minutes of today's session and respond to your questions. And please, you know, you've got some some guys like Chuck and Dennis and and Ben who are, you know, deeply involved in all of this and take advantage of their knowledge and expertise and experience. So submit some questions, and we'll be able to uh, hopefully address those. Uh, when we wind up, um, let's let's talk about practical considerations. Uh, how we either prioritize or deprioritize innovation, and and talk a little bit about this. So, what are some of the things that you guys feel are absolute priorities? We should we should get on this as quickly as possible. So, just to start off the conversation, because I know Dennis, you and Chuck are going to have a lot of thoughts as well. Typically, there is this connection between your strategy or vision and what you're going to ask your organization to execute on. And that middle part is the planning part, right? In other words, you have to be super clear about, um, based on your particular vision or strategy, how are you going to make that happen? Um, and so Mackenzie teased this up, I think, very well, where they're saying, look, if you're going to prioritize innovation, um, you have to adapt the core to meet the shifting consumer demands because that's just the nature of the market. It's changing. Whether we like it or not, it's changing. 
and therefore you have to identify and quickly address new areas of opportunity being created by the changing landscape um, and reevaluate the innovative you know, innovation initiative portfolio and ensure resources are allocated appropriately to make sure that you can maximize the, the consumer experience and therefore drive revenue and obviously at the same time balance your, your costs, but really to build the foundation for growth in order to be competitive in the post-crisis recovery period. It is really easy, however, to do what's on the right-hand side, right, which is to take a little more conservative approach, like let's shore up the core business, <clears throat> let's pursue known opportunity spaces, let's make sure we conserve our cash and, and minimize risk, and let's just wait until there is more clarity. And, and it doesn't mean that either of those are right or wrong, right, and that's, that's not the whole point of why we do these leader dialogue programs, it's just to tee up the the choices and the challenge of the choices, what is always there, I think, in our background, in our psyche, are the kinds of things we've seen in the past, um, like when uh, Netflix came in and completely consumed the video sales market, right, from, uh, I even forget the name of the company now that used to sell the... Blockbuster. Blockbuster, right? Everybody points to that as wow, that happened fast, but it actually didn't happen fast. It was building, and then it occurred fast from a consumer standpoint. <clears throat> the question is, what kinds of time transition windows are going to happen in the healthcare and provider space, uh, I think is kind of what's behind this particular part of the discussion. So De Dennis, this is Chuck. I, I have a question. I'm, I'm curious. Um, what do you see most of your current clients as considering their core business. I don't want to make an assumption that that we're that we all agree on what what we think the core. What is the core business? I mean, if you look at data, it certainly looks, and it's it's not been long enough, I think, to know. But it it, it doesn't appear that all of the inpatients are coming back. Right. It does appear that the number of outpatients is growing. There are still a number of things being done on the inpatient side of the house that could be done on the outpatient side of the house, but are prevented so because of the reimbursement mechanisms that are still in place in, in lots of the country. So I'm curious, what do you, what are your clients, what, if, I, if I were to ask your clients what they see as their core business right now, what do you think they'd say? I, I, I think most would say um, providing patient care. And strategies to uh, fill the towers, uh, you know, to provide to provide that care. I, I think to your point, Chuck, with the volumes not coming back, uh, I think the importance of the ambulatory enterprise is becoming that much more critical um, as we try to truly engage with consumers, which means that your physician strategy is, is that much more critical. I, I think that some health systems have um, maybe assumed that making a couple hundred thousand dollar in, uh, investment into or subsidy into our physician uh, per, on a per physician basis, which means that we're uh, dumping millions of dollars into the physician enterprise without necessarily getting a result for the health system is, is the way that the business should be ran. I think that many organizations who are forward thinking are, how do we really leverage our medical group, our physician enterprise to be an engine for growth, an uh, engine to recapture patients, to, to get more into the community, um, how do we build an ambulatory strategy where we're in the right place and we talked about the accessibility of healthcare? And how do we kind of rethink those models where it's not just a eight to five, but how do we provide uh, access at the right time and get in quickly at the hours that are appropriate for our population? How do we kind of connect that to service line strategies? And so we're actually building our service line strategy with the consumer at the center and not in, around health of the population, not necessarily always driving things back to the, to the uh, facilities. It's, it's interesting, last point I would make is uh, probably the number one call that we're getting right now is for access, consumer access. And so how do we begin to think about consumers um, in our communities and not waiting for them to just show up in an office or show up in, in, in one of our beds, but how do we become more Walmart-like? Um, how do we become more Amazon-like where we're actually pushing things out to the consumers who are in our marketplace to create tangible relationships with them that then become stickier where the majority of their care is being provided within our health system uh, versus right now, most health systems are probably seeing 60% plus of the business happen outside of their defined network because we don't have that sticky relationship. So rethinking how we engage consumers to provide more of that care together in our ambulatory enterprise 
is a lot of the innovation that we see happening through non-traditional ways to make that happen. Great answer, Dennis. Thank you so much. I, I'm going to, I think I'm going to go to questions at this point. Uh, we have several, quite a few good, really excellent questions, and I'll answer the first one. Um, are we able to get the slide deck post-session? And that is the case. Al, are you um, are you going to go through these questions, or do you want me to? You want to you want to take it from here? Well, I think you had a great idea, Roger. Why don't you take the first one? Okay, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's an easy one. Yes, the answer is yes. We will get this. We will make this slide deck available to all of you. Uh, you know, for from today's session. And uh, as always, I think if you have any questions that you didn't ask um, and would like to, you may contact any of us. All of our information is available there through the website, through through uh, Baldrige and, Foundation. And, and Dennis, um, you know, I know that you've authored a number of white papers on a lot of the things that you've been talking about today. Um, and if you don't mind, would you allow the audience to know what your uh, what your email is, just in case people want it, want to reach out uh, to you, get any of that information, or talk to you about any other issues they may be having. Yes, it's uh, dennis.butts at guidehouse.com. Great, Perfect. thank you. Perfect, thanks, Dennis. So, Al, do you want to go through these questions? Yeah, the first one is, uh, what are the health systems using to find the truth data, given the old structures that are not working well? Yes. Oh, I'll, I'll jump in if that, that's okay. Uh, sure. I, I, I know that um, uh, a lot of hospitals have focused more so on uh, inpatient data, but as I just talked about with so much of the care happening in the ambulatory enterprise and also uh, more so in these pay provider type relationships, uh, they're looking for unified data sets. And so we, we take advantage of data sets that are out there that give you the full claims experience of, for a population. And there are certain data houses that uh, have that information places like Care Journey. But I think that it, it, the source of truth now that unifies claims data that a, a health system would have, but also the full view of what a payer has. So you have the full 360 view of your population and can make insights, not just on who you are seeing, but who are the, the real consumers in your full geography, whether or not you're touching them or not. Uh, those seem to be the better data sets to make informed decisions from a pricing perspective and utilization perspective in given communities. And, and again, that's so true, Dennis. I, all of you have spent millions and millions of dollars on your EMR. And uh, please, please don't uh, assume that because you've done that, now you have the uh, source of truth. All, you've got a lot of data, but you're going to need some help in terms of turning that into usable, actionable information. And, uh, and Dennis just gave a great example of how to do that. Thanks for that question. Yeah, great, great answer to it. Next question is, what is the role of an academic medical center in the payvider landscape? Where do they fit as a tertiary center with a network of primary care? It's a it's a it's a great question, and uh, and, and Chuck mentioned that we we have uh, white papers uh, on on various topics, and we're actually working on uh, this exact white paper now. Uh, what is the role of AMC in, in the pay provider space? Because it's a great question. Um, we we see a lot of AMCs uh, moving away from just being the referral center to moving also into the community, and so we we are seeing that movement. Uh, but any population that you manage, there's still going to be the complex care that is needed that goes beyond what maybe a traditional community provider can uh, can can deliver. And so still having those meaningful connections uh, with the community. So when that uh, quaternary care is necessary, you need to have that transplant, et cetera. And how do we create care coordination back to the primary care, back to communities, knowing that you are an essential component um, of the care delivery system for the care that only you can provide? figuring out what that swim lane is and still being able to manage the care in a way that drives quality and cost effectiveness through care coordination that happens is a, is a great role for AMCs. Uh, we're also seeing AMCs play a role in the digital space. And so can we have a, a second opinion kind of service that is nationwide and not just in your own, own backyard, but can we bring your, your expertise to figure out for difficult to treat patients of what should be the next step that falls in line with some of the risk arrangements that are out there so that we're providing the right care, but maybe not going above and beyond what might be needed for a population. And we're seeing a lot of AMCs begin to consider 
a, a lot a wider catchment rate uh, based on some of the ways that we can interact with patients in a digital form that doesn't require them to actually be inside your facility. And Dennis, you know, we, we had a podcast uh, about uh, two months ago with uh, Julie Silverstein, the uh, chief medical officer at Oak Street, uh, because we wanted to really talk to somebody in the trenches at one of the alternative uh, primary care providers that we were talking about earlier. And they are most interested in finding a hospital and health system partners uh, within the areas that they that they have offices. And I think um, other of the alternative uh, providers that we've spoken about today are also looking for network associations because um, the, a number of those patients are going to need tertiary and quaternary care. And so um, I would suggest that you you know that AMCs um, look outside the traditional sort of partnerships that they may have looked at before, and there are other opportunities out there. One other opportunity, Chuck, that that I just have seen in my own family and in people that I know is in, in as people seek care at an academic medical center, people who need complex care, they have very complex medical issues and conditions. And, and oftentimes they either refer themselves or they might be referred from a primary care uh, provider who is in a system that has a lot of restrictions on them in terms of how much time they can spend with each patient, you know, and, and so what they're, what they need is somebody who can devote the time to them for them to them to coordinate all of this. And you've got multiple specialists to coordinate, to take care of this complex condition that you have. And, and again, what I'm seeing, and I, this is not not going to be universally adopted, but we have to become more like this. I've seen a lot of these people go to a concierge physician or a direct patient care provider. And, uh, and that is, seems to be the answer for them. They need somebody who has the curiosity, who has the skill set. And I'm looking at you, you know, uh, uh, Chuck, because, you know, this is the world that you came out of. Somebody who can say, yes, I'll coordinate that. I'll help interpret these things for you. So our, our systems need to be more like that. And I just challenge those of you who are listening, especially those of you who are part of an academic medical center. It's not enough to have really highly trained, qualified specialists, specialists and subspecialists and in this quaternary care realm. But the patient, the end user needs to understand this and take that and know, what do I do next? What do I stop doing? What do I start doing? So it, there's a, yeah, there's a gap there. Yeah, and Roger, that really that navigation feature that you're talking about is really a part of of um, curating the consumer experience. Yeah. They're, uh, otherwise, they're not going to come to you, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay, we we got a lot of questions, so I guess yeah, we'll our next that. our next yeah. question here is something I've heard you all talk about before. I mean, each and every one of you, and that is: is there enough money in population health to support both the existing health system infrastructure and insurance company profits? <laughs> Nobody well, wants to take this one. Go ahead, I just froze for a minute there. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. I, I was Dennis. concerned that we lost Dennis. Is Dennis still there? Yeah. 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 Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sure. And and I I think that it's a really good question because when you look at uh, legacy CIN ACO infrastructures that uh, oftentimes for health systems that they put in millions of dollars for care coordinators or technology, et cetera. Uh, then you were uh, having a race to the bottom. So you only got paid as you took health system revenue out and the payment mechanism was uh, get 50 cents back on the dollar. So th those economics don't, don't work in uh, any, any, part of, any part of the country. Um, the new paid provider models that are out there that are giving providers more access to the premium dollar and not just relying upon shared savings, there is enough are enough dollars there, and particularly in the uh, Medicare population. So that the Medicare population, the uh, per member per month uh, uh, premium dollars, typically around a thousand twelve hundred bucks. That you in a commercial population, you may be only around a uh, three to four hundred dollars. And so I would say the population matters um, in Medicare. Large enough premium, and typically a, enough overutilization of services that you can make the numbers work if you are uh, have a clinical engine that is strong enough to also help you take on some of the downside risk. Um, that isn't something that you have to take on year one or year two in order to have a sustainable financial model, but giving some hint to the payer that you're able to help them with their RAF accuracy 
um, as, as the, the coding accuracy goes up, the premium dollar goes up. Uh, so there's more money to, to go around there. Um, if you help them get four or five ratings on their stars, uh, the health plan gets a 5% bonus. And so as you're able to kind of help on some of the levers that really help premium dollar access to a health plan, those things can trickle down to a provider in a big enough dollar amount where your investments that you're taking on can lead to a reasonable return. Um, but you have to be focused in, in, in the, the right line of business with enough membership with the right contracting model to make all that work, but it is possible. Anybody else have some input on that one? Nope, I think that's a good that answer. That's good, okay. that's great. All right, this next one is, uh, for health systems, is it smarter to partner with pay providers and disruptive non-traditional providers or try to compete with them? So I can take a first stab at that, and Dennis, you probably want to follow up. Um, I think in the new economy, what you have to do is realize what you are going to do best. So for example, if you're a tertiary health system, you should specialize on what you do best. And then from the standpoint of the consumer, uh, consumers, and I'm speaking broadly, who you're going to service, what are the other partners that are going to best enable you to meet that consumer need and demand? Um, but typically it's best to, to sort of, you know, stick to the knitting and look for partnerships because it's going to be hard to compete in areas where you don't already have really well-defined um, capabilities. So that that typically is the is the recommendation to that question. Dennis, did you have a different thought? No, I I, I can completely agree. And, and, and markets matter. Um, where the organization is positioned matters. Um, what are the capabilities that they have today? Um, we I, I often say that sometimes your fee for service competitors can be your fee for value um, um, uh, teammates, uh, that everyone that you've historically have seen as a threat as you begin to truly manage population health and the coordinated care that needs to happen inside of a market, you may begin to look at some of the players differently. Um, but I completely agree. If we're going to excel, uh, you need to understand what you're going to be good at. And you're maybe not going to build all capabilities necessary to be successful or a partnership matter. A uh, partnership model is maybe better for you in those circumstances, which can include primary care disruptors, even if you are a health system, if you're going to manage that care together and still be rewarded for it. Yeah, in the old days, I think non-traditional providers needed sort of the halo that the health system had, sort of the endorsement, if you will. I don't think that's the case anymore. And they may not be as eager to participate or to partner with us, the health systems, as they once were. And so- hey. Hey Dennis, I'm going to go out on go out on a limb here just for a second, and um, this this may be a little bit controversial, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go out there anyway. After COVID, I know we still haven't had a lot of time, but do you think it's fair to say that the that the fee for service model, the traditional fee for service model, associated with where the current levels and future levels of reimbursement look like they're going in the fee for service model? are just not compatible with margins that are going to allow most systems, not every, but most systems to continue to thrive, not just survive. We, we can completely agree. Um, uh, and when, when we look at uh, the utilization of services, the aging of the population, um, states and federal governments are gonna continue to be strained from a budgetary perspective. And so, the, the margins aren't going to be there. They're going to be winners and losers in, in different markets. And, and as consumers continue to choose, you know, providers over others, um, everyone's not going to have a sustainable future. And so building a capabilities and truly innovating to know what you do best and focus on that in your marketplace to have a sustainable position, it, it will be a requirement moving forward. But status quo um, isn't going to lead to sustainability for a, a lot of organizations across many different markets. Thank you. You know, that's, that reminds, sorry, sorry to skip ahead, Al, but there's a question in here about that requires sort of a technical answer, but I think we can opine on it of total physician compensation. What percentage of value-based payments is the tipping point for when you switch to capitation? You know, we haven't talked about capitation for a long time. It's not a, 
you know, super popular topic, but that's a, I think that's a really interesting question that we're considering that now, given yeah. the environment. Yeah, well, I think it, it comes from the pandemic as well. Uh, those who had capitated arrangements when the volume left, uh, they, they, they had a sustainable revenue stream coming in and, and that, that caused some that, that maybe weren't looking to take on, you know, the, the full accountability for a population to reconsider that. Um, to kind of future proof their their organization. Um, I, I think that it, it, until you really get to a point where at least 20% of your business is kind of in a, a different payment model, it, it's hard to really transform, you know, a physician practice when this is only 5% of your revenue or even 5%, you know, of, 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 of the patients that you're treating on a day-to-day -day basis. I, I think once you begin to get around 20% that are in some form of risk contracts that you begin to have enough momentum to, think about completely transforming not only your business model, but your care processes, workflows, et cetera, to deliver that care in a, in a different space. That's great. Good, good. Do we have time for a couple more, Al? I think we do. And the yeah. next one is, if I decide to partner with a payer, what criteria should I use to determine the best partner fit? Yeah, I, I think that you 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 want a plan uh, that has four or five stars. That you want a plan that's maybe number one or number two with uh, market share uh, that has a stable operating mar margin, probably around three to five percent. Uh, that isn't bringing a, a ton of administrative costs to the table. Best in class uh, ALR would be six to eight percent. And so I, I I think as you're looking at at your payers, you want them to be sustainable. Um, you want them to have membership. And then also the ability to bring you membership. I mean, so that this doesn't become a zero sum game, you should be able to grow together. But those would be some of the things that I would look for um, as far as uh, a sustainable partner in your market. Great. At this time, uh, I want to thank the five of you for such a great presentation today. This is very, very interesting. I want to remind the audience that, you know, all of the slides and the presentation will be available on the Institute uh, website early next week. And so at this time, I'm just going to open it up for any closing comments that each of you may have. Uh, just my only comment, Al, is that, you know, there are some great questions that we didn't get to. And perhaps that's something that we can take a stab at after the fact and and type an answer into uh, for these folks or get back to them. So thank you so much. I want to thank our audience for their great questions. Yeah. The only other thing that I was going to add, Al, is that it's really important more than ever in this phase to stay curious, where we often get information in our particular line. You know, we, we, we go to our provider conferences or, or our payer conferences or whatever the case may be. In this case, really being broad and staying curious, understanding what are the technology advances, what's actually happening in the payvider space, et cetera, really enables organizations to be able to cross map their strategy with what's actually happening in the market and have a much improved SWOT analysis to be able to determine how they want to move forward. So I think staying and being really curious now is, is very important. And I'm really encouraged, this is Chuck, I'm really encouraged by the questions. I don't want to read too much into them, but it, it feels to me like people are seriously considered, um, considering changing the, the paradigm that we've had in place just for so many years, because I, I think people are starting to recognize that this is just not uh, attainable and it's not going to continue to, to allow us to, to, to thrive. It may allow us to survive, uh, but I think most uh, most of us in the audience and most most health systems don't want to just survive. All good points. And you know one more uh, thing I'll throw in there too about Baldridge is that a lot of what we discussed today is aligned with Baldridge, especially in the customer category. And there's a great deal of this discussion throughout the criteria when it comes to partner relationships. So referring to the Baldridge criteria for performance excellence is a great way to further explore your curiosity and try to find solutions uh, to these challenging problems. Thanks again, everybody. And uh, as a reminder to uh, our audience, we have a number of courses that we're showcasing this month, one of which is supply chain management and our upcoming Mastering Strategy in Healthcare Bootcamp, which will be presented this fall. Uh, to learn more about those courses, please visit our website at baldridgeinstitute.org. And once again, thank you to all of our sponsors, especially members of the Mac Baldridge Society who make webinars like today's possible. 
Thanks again, everybody, for tuning in. Stay safe and have a great day.